I'm Dan Langley, and this is the Manufacturing IT Podcast. In each episode, I speak with the key people of influence within smart manufacturing. In each conversation, we unpack and dissect all things Industry 4.0, from technology and trends to the ever-evolving digital manufacturing landscape. Let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Manufacturing IT Podcast. I'm joined today by Mo Abwali. Mo, welcome to the podcast. Daniel, pleasure to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time, Mo, to speak with us. And, you know, you and I have been connected for a little while now, met a couple of times online, and I think you're part of, you said, my MES WhatsApp community is great. So maybe you can share some uh, introduction into yourself and a little bit more about you. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I've been in manufacturing for almost 25 years. Um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working half of my career in manufacturing plants on the shop floor, uh, serving companies like Toyota, for example, coming out of the automotive industry. And uh, the second part of my career was on the other side of the aisle, serving manufacturers with uh, digital solutions. Uh, you mentioned MES, manufacturing execution systems, IoT platforms all the way to artificial intelligence solutions. So my my career has really been around how can we help manufacturers improve their people, process, technology, and overall strategy to, to become more competitive in, in the global landscape. Yeah, and I think it's, a, it's an area that I'm super passionate about, the listenership and audience on the podcast as well, super passionate about. So to have someone with your level of experience, Mo, is great on the podcast, and we're really looking forward to hear a bit more about your thoughts. Mo, talk to us a little bit about your PhD, your industrial engineering uh, degree. It'd be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. I I followed a unique route to get my PhD, actually. It was not a theoretical research type of dissertation. Uh, it was actually applied mm. practical research in manufacturing companies. So I was part of wow. a Center for Intelligent Maintenance Systems, IMS, at the University of Cincinnati. And um, the whole model was how can we embed researchers in industrial companies to deliver results and, and practical uh, you know, R&D activities. So I had the pleasure of working across the globe in the States, in Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, and I saw different cultures. I saw different mindsets around smart manufacturing, predictive analytics. My dissertation was actually on leveraging AI and predictive maintenance you know, almost 20 years ago. Uh, where wow. you know the cost of sensors and hardware was very expensive, the cloud was not around. So fast forward <laughs> 20 years today, there's just so many opportunities now to accelerate implementation of these types of solutions and do it more affordably and get quick time to value. So it's it's impressive what's what's been going on in the space uh, in the past 20 years or so. Yeah, and I must admit, you know, it, it does sound like a really interesting journey that you've been on, Mo. And I guess one of the things that stood out for me with, with your experience is that you, your title now is Trusted Advisor. And that's a term that we hear so much in the industry. You know, we want to be our client's trusted advisor. But but I guess someone like yourself, the journey you've been on, you know, you really own that title, right? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um... I, I would say my career has been around working with large enterprise companies um, who have been, I would say, lucky and, 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 and blessed to have, you know, strong people and resource access and strong infrastructure, IT, OT. Uh, but I've pivoted into serving and becoming a trusted advisor to small and middle market companies. So those are companies that are you know, 10 mil in revenue up to maybe 200 mil in annual revenue. So they're, they're mm. facing a lot of challenges. They're facing infrastructure challenges. They're facing uh, how, how do I justify return on investment from implementing these industry 4.0 IoT solutions that, that we're going to talk about. So it's, it's been an interesting pivot for me. And, um, you know, small and medium sized manufacturers make up more than 90% of the market here in North America. I mean, it's it's a huge portion of, of companies that are serving the larger OEMs. So it's been an interesting yeah. challenge pivoting into this market. And, you know, back in the day, you had to go through all kinds of hierarchy to get to the decision makers. And, you know, you go into a small manufacturer, you're meeting the owner. And the owner has mm -hmm. built that business for the past uh, few decades. And 
they're thinking about succession planning, they're thinking about competitiveness. How can I stay in business? How can I grow my business? So uh, we're, we're very proud of what we do at Whipfleet, uh, where I am a trusted advisor uh, as part of the manufacturing and retail and distribution space. Yeah, I, I think it's really an interesting one. And the big part, you know, as I said to you off camera, I'm based in the UK, based in London. And the whole reason we've had to pivot so much to do so much of our MES industry corporate recruitment efforts into North America is purely because the UK is, is not made up of those small and mid-sized manufacturers. We only have really the, the, the top tier manufacturers. And as you say, all of the challenges with, with getting through to decision makers. But it sounds like the work you're doing is working with you know, working with and being able to affect change and really kind of feel like the tangible benefit of that change for the owners or the, the SMMs. That's correct. And I and I like your acronym, SMMs. That's that's definitely how we refer to that market. So small and medium sized manufacturers. Um, mm. You know, we, we are really trying to have SMMs think about embracing uh, smart manufacturing and industry 4.0. But the, the unfortunate mm. fact in many cases is when we go and, and assess and, and look at the SMM operation, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of challenges, right? They have older legacy machines on the floor. They have outdated IT systems, especially ERP systems. I'm talking green screen ERPs. <laughs> in some cases, no ERPs. Uh, they're using wow. QuickBooks and some other tools and spreadsheets. You know, some say the number one software in uh, in SMM manufacturing today is uh, is Microsoft Excel. Uh, there's a lot of use of spreadsheets. <laughs> it's it's all it's all you yeah. know Excel based. It's manually uh, documented. So we're we're you know to jump into the the bandwagon of 4.0, um, there has to be some improvement of that technology stack in order to allow those manufacturers to to go beyond. But at the same time. You know, it, they're, they're facing uh, ROI challenges, maybe financial challenges to justify people and, and process within the company may not be mature. So we, we mm. like to think of the concept of digital maturity. The digital maturity yeah. of small and medium sized companies, unfortunately, is not as high as the, the Fortune 500. So we're looking for ways to educate and assess and roadmap and reskill and upskill the organization so they can get to that level of, of jump in the chasm into uh, 4.0. Yeah, and I think digital maturity is a topic that I spoke about before on the show here and, and with people as well. But talk us through Mo, a little bit about what digital maturity means to Wifley and maybe, and I'm also thinking maybe in the context here is there's business leaders from SMMs listening, you know, maybe you could share some insight on digital maturity so that they could have a mental checklist or start to consider how, how digitally mature they are and their operations are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, at Woodfleet, we're, we go to market by industry vertical. So I'm part of manufacturing, retail and distribution. And we pride ourselves working with more than 7,000, you know, MRD accounts, manufacturing, retail and distribution accounts. Uh, and they're all of the size of the small and middle market, you know, 20 mil low up to 250 mil revenue range. Um, so we we offer a lot of complementary tools, actually, as part of Whipfleet Digital. We want to make it easy for small and mid-sized folks to jump into the industry 4.0 and, and digital transformation space. So we, we go into the company, we offer industry 4.0 and AI training. Uh, education is usually a good start so folks learn all the lingo and terminology that you're hearing uh, all around you uh, from machine monitoring up to generative AI and large language models what, what does all that mean to me mm -hmm. and then after that education we go in and conduct assessments innovation workshops uh, digital assessments and that helps us understand that digital maturity not just around technology, but also around the people and around the process. So, for example, the change management you know, element. Yeah, it's a big it's a big uh, area, you know, P, uh, production, quality, maintenance. So we have a way to assess that and kind of score it. And also we have a large mm. benchmark database of plastics companies, molding companies, uh, stamping companies. So we can benchmark the digital maturity to a large database that we have. We call it Whipfleet yeah. IQ. And that allows the manufacturer to also see where are they in the spectrum? 
with similar companies in similar industry uh, and and similar revenue range. You know, so it's it's a very competitive benchmark. And seeing is believing, right? Once you see the numbers, we can start giving recommendations and creating a a short term and a long term roadmap for improvement. Yeah, and I think I think you know over the last kind of what four or five years before COVID even, the whole nearshoring topic was really big news. A lot of companies needing to improve their operations, improve their their bottom line as well. And, and being able to benchmark against similar companies is invaluable, right? Because we know how siloed data is in huge companies, but these smaller companies are siloed as well, right? And, and it's hard to know what good looks like or, or what you know Industry 4.0 actually means to you know a, a smaller business. Absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, over the years, we've accumulated that, you know, Wifley IQ database of, uh, you know, big industry verticals that we play. So, for example, plastics mm. is a big industry for us. So we work with mold builders and mold makers and injection molders and all these companies. And we, we are also reaching out to some of the key associations like MAP, which is the Plastics Processors Association in North America and the PMA, the Precision Manufacturers Association. So we're trying to build those association relationships because you know, our clients are their members and vice versa. And we're trying to offer these educational sessions and assessment innovation workshops, um, in addition to benchmark data, not just within Whitley, but benchmark data from MAP and PMA and, and other associations out there. So that, that is helping manufacturers to you know, get a get a mirror, you know, of their current state, like where are you today compared to your peers in the industry? And then this allows us yeah. to start thinking, what are recommendations for the next steps? Like, are you a high level of digital maturity where you are ready for generative AI use cases? Or are you at a lower <laughs> level of digital maturity where you need data to feed those AI models? If you don't have the data <laughs> yeah. or the data quality or the data integrity, putting your stuff in chat GPT is, is garbage in, garbage out. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's all science at the end of the day, but a lot of folks don't understand the science behind it and they think of the tools as a shiny object. Uh, but again, if you educate and assess and roadmap, you can be much more successful uh, in, in your journey to, to industry 4.0. Yeah, and I think I think you highlight a good point there, Mo, because nowadays with you know how clever marketing becomes from big companies, how clever you know uh, we hear buzzwords every time you open LinkedIn and, and you go to these kind of trade shows and you hear kind of the shiny objects and stuff like that. It's so easy to get sucked into that loop of chasing tech for tech's sake, rather than actually thinking what's the business case, what's the business outcome we are actually chasing here. And I think sometimes, yeah, you thumbs up, right? Totally agree. That's good. But I think sometimes people. You know, it can be so easy to focus on following what a vendor says because the vendor wants you to buy their licenses and get stuck into right. a vendor lock. So, yeah, I think the educational piece, working with associations is so important because you kind of build that credibility, but you also be able to provide some, some, some benchmarks and, and data. That's right. That's right. Um, we, you know, at, at Whipfully, we also like to grow and, and merge in companies that support our mission. And we've recently mm. merged in a, a, a very renowned company in Michigan called Harbor Results. And Harbor Results and, you know, Miss Lori Harbor and Mr. Scott Walton and some of the folks there, they've built a very large database of molding companies and stamping companies. And uh, they brought in a very unique business assessment and technology assessment where we can go in and out of a manufacturing plant and assess their business and technology uh, in six or seven key categories. Um, and not just in the manufacturing side, but how are you doing on sales and growth? You know, what are you doing around marketing? What are you doing around digital? So having this uh, multi-prong assessment, uh, which is extremely mm -hmm. affordable, um, we even do complementary assessments for companies that really want to get started but don't have the funds to get started. So we're, we're doing all that we can to have manufacturers embrace and get educated and assess and roadmap their journey. Uh, an interesting nugget of information is we publish an annual state of manufacturing survey. So we go to our customers and recently we've surveyed about 350 SMMs, as you say, small and medium sized manufacturers in North America across almost 30 states. 
and we ask him some digital questions about you know future so 99 percent of respondents are prioritizing digital investments this year which which is a whopping mm -hmm. very big number for small companies uh, but only 30 percent have started to trial you know advanced ai type of solutions so big gap right and that also shows mm -hmm. that some of the major investments they're putting in right now is what i call the plumbing you know they're fixing the cloud mm -hmm. they're fixing the servers they're fixing the cybersecurity. they're networking their machines once that plumbing is in place you know those you know you can get part of that 30 percent who are starting to implement ai and you get the data flowing so we yeah. we offer a breadth and depth of solutions for low maturity medium maturity high maturity companies and we just want to help small and medium-sized manufacturers like you said to achieve the business case you got to start with the why you know why are you embarking on this journey and how can you measure success at every phase of your journey yeah, and I think it leads quite nicely, Mo, to like one of the questions I had lined up. And it was kind of like interested to get, I guess, with all that data you're getting, all those conversations you're having, what are some of the kind of trends and technology advancements that you're seeing in the SMM space? Like what kind of like trends can you share and, and what things yeah. are you seeing? I, I think the, the whole vision uh, in the industry today is how can I guide my factory toward near zero downtime and near zero mm. defects? and near zero waste right so reducing unplanned downtime reducing scrap and improving sustainability of the manufacturing operation so this dovetails into some of the key trends that we're seeing and you know the the initial trend for smms is how can i get started how do i collect real-time data from my shop floor how can i track true uptime true scrap true throughput how can I leverage data coming from my ERP system? Uh, as, as you know, in the MES space, there's always a big disconnect between shop floor to top floor, as we say. The business system says mm -hmm. something and the shop floor says something and there's a lot of good old paper in the middle flowing <laughs> back and forth. Yeah. So that's, that's the beginning, right? You gotta collect real-time data mm -hmm. and I, I call it industrial machine learning. You gotta start learning what's happening in your operation. The second mm -hmm. trend and we're seeing very heavy need for advanced planning and scheduling. How can I schedule yeah. better? Many ERP systems don't do scheduling. Companies are always exporting into good old Excel sheets and massaging the schedule in Excel. So there are tools that can help with better planning and scheduling, advanced planning and scheduling. Mm -hmm. And this can help you improve your standards, improve your costing, improve your job profitability in your business. Um, the third one is what I like to say, you know, some industries are starting to mandate environmental social governance, you know, ESG and mm. sustainability type of activities. So how can I reduce my carbon footprint? How can I improve my greenhouse emissions in my operation? Even if you're not mandated to follow certain rules or laws, uh, it's it's a very tangible outcome, you know. Reduced power consumption equals, you know, improved profits in the business. Mm -hmm. So many companies are are doing it for the sake of improving their the business bottom line. Um, the fourth is more around advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, and maybe we can talk in a you know in the next point about generative AI and some of the uses cases out there that can improve labor efficiency and and improve. Uh, you know, content creation and some of those mundane routine tasks that humans are doing. And last but not least, I think the fifth trend we're seeing is let's not forget the worker, okay? We talk about connected mm -hmm. assets and connected machines and connected products, but connected workers is a big domain. Uh, these tools are yeah. not there to replace people. We have to rescale and upscale people so they can use more advanced tools mm -hmm. so they can do their job better. It's a decision support tool. You know, I like to say AI is like augmented intelligence. You're augmenting the worker's intelligence to improve what they're doing. <laughs> so there's a, a bunch yeah. of connected worker applications that not only help on the shop floor, but can be used in training and onboarding like augmented reality, mixed reality, simulations. So high level, these are the five major trends I'm seeing, we are seeing at Whipfly from industrial mm -hmm. machine learning to improving scheduling and forecasting to improving sustainability all the way to connected worker and generative AI application. 
And obviously you can see really each of those five trends is a very clear uh, measurable ROI really, right? And we're not talking about necessarily even doing more, but we're kind of talking about even just saving <laughs> cost. You know, it's one thing actually improving output, improving throughput, but if we're just even reducing the amount of money that we waste, that's an ROI win as well. So that's a huge part. Mo, talk us through some of the like challenges and barriers then that these SMMs are faced when trans transitioning to more digital initiatives, Industry 4.0. What are some of the kind of pitfalls, barriers, challenges that, that you guys bump into and see? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, people process technology is always the, you know, the Venn diagram that I have in the back of my mind. On the technology front, mm. right? IT, OT, information technology, operational technology. Old IT systems, old machines on the floor, uh, no connectivity, uh, you know, lack of security, networking. So th these are technology mm. challenges, just to name a few. Uh, but more of a challenge, becoming more of a challenge, is uh, process challenges, right? So we, sometimes companies reach out to us and say, I want to put vibration sensors on all my machines to do predictive maintenance, right? But then when you dig into the maintenance process that they have today, it's not mature. They don't have a PM process. They're not doing preventive maintenance. So jumping a gun to technology uh, is not the right thought uh, in this case. You have to have a strong, solid process in place first uh, in order to implement technology to support that process. So process challenges. Um, and then people, like you, you were mentioned earlier, change management. Um, we need mm. friendly user experiences. We need, uh, you know, human-centric uh, machine interfaces, HMIs, as they call it, right? Human machine interfaces. Mm. Um, you, you just, you need to empower the operator with tools that are easy to use, reliable, can give them what they need to run their job in a very efficient way, and not clunky interfaces and clunky user experiences that. That, that just don't work. Um, so change management is a big factor and assessing the change management readiness of the organization is important. Having a multidisciplinary team, top down, bottom up, right? From the operator to the supervisor, to the plant manager, to the C-level, uh, that center of excellence concept, COE, allows companies to ensure that these solutions become successful on the shop floor. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm coming at that from, from a recruitment perspective where we see numerous challenges with frontline operations, <clears throat> upskilling, but even engaging and retaining some of the top talent in manufacturing, right? I, I think I saw a statistic that the average time in shop floor manufacturing is about three years or so. And you think how much training, institutional knowledge, insight that those people, operators might have is one thing, but then the people aging out and retiring and leaving the workforce again is another. So that kind of having technology to be able to facilitate the prescriptive recommendations, the training, the you know the onboarding, getting people into into the right areas, it, it's so pivotal, right? And I guess it can be a blessing and a curse because if you don't have it, you can't do it. But if you have it, but it's not adopted or it's the wrong interface or doesn't look you know you worker friendly then you're going to be challenged at, at every level. So I think all of those are so important, Mo. Absolutely. And I, I would say um, there are some stats out there that are looking at the average tenure or age of a skilled operator mm. on a shop floor. And in aerospace and defense, for example, um, you know, at, at one of the largest OEMs out there making engines, the average age of an operator on the shop floor is literally 55 years old. So imagine wow. this operator is going to retire in the next five to 10 years, and there's a huge knowledge gap. There's a huge knowledge transfer opportunity that needs to occur. Mm. And you have folks, you know, that are millennials or border millennials coming in. They're digital natives, right? They know how to use a cell phone from, uh, from a very young age, um, but they don't know manufacturing. They don't know how to run a CNC controller or a, or a PLC recipe. <laughs> So big gap. So how can we transfer that, you know, 30 plus years of knowledge gap? Um, and again, industry 4.0 tools like generative AI and augmented reality and, you know, digital work instructions and some of those innovative tools out there are starting to think about how can I harness that knowledge, right? And, and write it and summarize it so that future generation can use that knowledge. I mean, we don't even take notes in 
Teams meetings or Zoom meetings anymore. <laughs> there is an AI bot that did. documents the whole meeting and it knows who's there and who said what and what are the actions, you know? Just labor efficiency mm. and document management and knowledge transfer has become extremely, you know, easier, I would say, with, with tools that, that we're seeing nowadays. Yeah, and, and, and talking about AI is probably a good, a good step for this conversation, right? I liked your term, augmented intelligence. I think it's a really good one. You know, I, I like that because it's one thing having the tools, but knowing how to, you know, ask the right questions or, or, to, or search for the right data is important. But Mo, talk us through crystal ball time here, but talk us through what you think AI will be doing for manufacturers in the next kind of, you know, two, three, four, five years. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would like to say, you know, AI is not a new or novel concept at all. I mean, we were doing AI 20 years ago in uh, high volume facilities like automotive production. I like to classify AI as you got industrial AI applications or industrial machine learning, and you have generative AI or generative machine learning because the applications are different and, you know, the algorithms and the science is different in both. Um, but industrial AI or machine learning has been around for a long time. You know, we're talking about using data and sensors for predictive maintenance of machines. Uh, we're using machine vision and cameras to do predictive quality and safety tracking and you know, improving uh, scrap rates and all that. So there, there's a huge domain of, of decades of experience working with machine data, sensor data, machine vision, cameras, et cetera, et cetera to drive zero downtime, zero defects in manufacturing. Um, today, um, you know, a subset of machine learning is what's called deep learning. So these are algorithms mm -hmm. like neural networks that gave birth to generative machine learning or generative AI. And it's, it's very impressive what the technology has become. Like for example, in the latest uh, GPT-4 by OpenAI, right? You, you have a multimodal system. What does that mean? I can give you text, I can give the algorithm videos, I can give the algorithm pictures. So different file formats, different modes of data, and then you can prompt and, and ask the, the GPT model or the AI model to give you a decision. So content creation, write me an email, summarize. So is a huge you know, NLP, we call it, natural language processing use case there to create new content or to summarize text or to review information. So this has significantly improved labor efficiency. Um, and then there is content creation, you know, create a picture or uh, create a video even. So some, some very slick tools can do that. Create a whole PowerPoint deck for me. Um, and then- That would be good, I need some help with that. Yeah, man. Uh, and, 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 and most <laughs> recently, um, you know, a third very interesting use case I'm seeing is it can actually learn to code. So it can learn your code and it can create new code wow. And I'm seeing some companies that are starting to program the robots and program their CNCs and write, you know, PLC code. Uh, again, I wouldn't trust running that code on my machine without validation. You know, I always <laughs> believe there's a human yeah. in the loop, right? So trust and verify. So I think those solutions, mm -hmm. again, they're not replacing humans, but you know, they're going to give you higher labor efficiency to get things done. But a human needs to review and approve uh, the the output of the AI model. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, seeing how far, you know, talking to people as well about the use of AI, and, and you mentioned one of the trends earlier is in predictive planning and scheduling. I mean, it's such an important part. It's such a, a great use case of an AI tool to learn your process, learn your scheduling, learn your operations to be able to give those recommendations. I mean, it's such a simple um concept but really you know you think how much the savings would be in labor efficiency and production efficiency it's crazy so i think we can only expect to see more and more um mature uses uses even of ai and ai tools right absolutely but again going to your question on challenges you know the the companies have to be aware right there there is ethical challenges there's security challenges um you have to make sure you know the those AI models, again, it's, it's science. You've got to train the models with data. So you have to make sure mm -hmm. if you have confidential data, you know, don't go out to open AI chat GPT and put confidential data. <laughs> um, you have to yeah. set up your own secure environment to train on your own data and, and have a secure, you know, training and testing approach. Uh, at Wifley, you know, for example, we 
from day one, we completely closed access to all these tools. Like I cannot access chat GPT on my Wifley laptop for security purposes. Um, we're okay. a large accounting and advisory firm. It doesn't make sense. So we contracted with Microsoft as a strategic partner with Microsoft. And we have a private version of Bing AI, as they call it. So that allows you to be secure and use your own data to train your own models. So I think ethical considerations, regulatory considerations, uh, data security, data privacy. I mean, these are all things that chief information officers and, and CISO security officers need to be aware of. And again, just like education and assessment of Industry 4.0, you need to have an AI strategy, starting with AI education, AI assessment, AI roadmap, and make sure all this is ironed out, you know, and communicated well within your organization. And these are even some of the recommendations, right? That it's one thing implementing a tool, but it's all the other security and in data integrity pieces that you have to include as well, right? So these new roles, I, I've seen an advert for a, a chief AI officer, um, which is a job title I never saw before, which has now kind of exploded on. And I guess we're gonna see more of these type jobs, job titles and, and leadership positions. Um, but Mo, we're, we're, look, we're approaching the end of the podcast, right? And this has been a great episode, the time's flown by. and. You know, there's going to be a few people listening now on, on, in, in the SMM space, the, the small, mid, mid-sized manufacturing space, who, who want to get started with maybe an Industry 4.0 initiative, an AI tool. Talk, talk us through maybe a recommendation to, to finish with, Mo, on, on where someone can get started and, and maybe a, a quick win, quote unquote. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I would say, um, and you may have heard this term many times, think big, start small, scale fast. Um, I, and, and act now. I think a lot of SMMs are hesitating to act. Um, they're waiting, they're following. I, I don't think that's wise. The, the market is becoming very competitive and if you're not getting educated and if you're not strategizing and doing it in your business, I can bet your competitors are doing that already and the market is becoming extremely competitive. So think big, get educated, assess and create your roadmap, start small, select the right solutions with the right business case and start trialing and piloting those solutions and we're seeing the biggest wins on the shop floor in manufacturing improving production improving quality improving maintenance that's the bottom line of your business so start there and then scale it to other functions of the business like sales and marketing and supply chain etc etc uh, but act mm -hmm. now um, the good news is, and a lot of folks don't act now because they're hesitant about the return on investment and how do I fund this, right? But there's a lot of funding opportunities and there's a lot of free tools and there's a lot of free education. As I mentioned, we at Wifley, we're offering a complimentary Industry 4.0 AI training as well as a complimentary half-day rapid assessment or a roadmap. And we're even offering some free software tools to get you started, you know? Pick a few machines wow. on the floor, get them connected in, in days, not months, and start seeing that data flow and start using that data to drive change. Um, so that's, that's my honest feedback to the small and medium manufacturers. Don't hesitate, act now, but do it right. It's like building mm -hmm. skyscrapers. You gotta have a solid deep foundation of education assessment roadmap and then the skyscrapers will will rise very quickly and with with a great level of success yeah mo i think a really really nice closing statement there i really like that so i appreciate that i'm probably going to snip that into a, a quick uh, uh, youtube short as well well i think that was great so appreciate your time on the podcast Re really grateful for your time your your knowledge and insight and so uh yeah, thanks mate it's a pleasure daniel thanks for the opportunity thank you well that's it for another episode thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoyed the conversation and are a little bit more knowledgeable after the episode if you're a fan of the show please like, share and subscribe with your colleagues and friends and if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode just drop me a note on LinkedIn see you next time